series of Brain Injury Lunch and Learn. Um, so part one is going to be on symptomology of brain injury and special populations. So that that's what we're going to focus on um, today. Um, I'm the presenters are well Rebecca Quinn and Carly Endries, but to my understanding, Carly, you're going to be kind of taking taking over for today. OK, awesome. Um, for those that don't know who I am, I'm Kelly Larson. I work with Behavioral Health Division, um, more specifically with the Community Connect program as a case lead. Um, so I'm the host for today. I'm going to monitor the chat. If you guys have any questions um, during it, um, I'll do my best to try to maybe interject and ask if something comes up afterwards as well. Um, that's something that I can try to connect you to the presenters if you don't, um, if you didn't jot down their contact information um, and they can answer your questions as well. Um, at the end, I'll put it in the chat and then I'll also send an email out um, to those that are in attendance to do a survey that is anonymous. And then also it will ask you if you would like to receive a certificate of attendance or and or CEUs. Um, because the three part series has an opportunity for you to have one CEU per session. Um, so just remember to keep yourselves muted um, just to be respectful of those in attendance. Feel free to eat your lunch during this time too. Um, of course, like if you want to stay on camera, great. If you want to go off camera because you're eating, you know, like a steak or you know what I mean? Something extravagant, then don't make the rest of us that aren't eating jealous. Um, but without further ado, thank you guys so much for um, for joining us today. And Carly, I'll let you take it away. Sounds great. Thank you thank for having you. us. You're welcome. Yeah, thank we're you. excited for this series. It's always um, important to talk about, right? Um, so um, I am the senior project coordinator for the North Dakota Brain Injury Network. I am housed in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Uh, and Rebecca Quinn is our director, and she is also housed in Grand Forks. Uh, we are part of the med school on UND's campus, uh, and most of our funding comes from the Department of Health and Human Services Behavioral Health Division. Um, we do have some supplemental funding that we got from an uh, administration of community living grant as well. Um, so yeah, my background is special education, so my master's is in special ed. Um, you'll see CBIST behind both Rebecca and I's names, and then CBIS is Certified Brain Injury Specialist, and then the T is for trainer, so we are able to train on that. So that is a certification available um, nationwide, but we brought it here to North Dakota and we host the training for it, and then you sit for the exam with the Brain Injury Association of America. But if what I say today um, strikes a note with you and you think um, it's something you want to dive deeper into, that training would be a great option for that. So. Um, all right, I threw Rebecca and I's emails in the chat, but um, very informal. Feel free to interrupt me as I'm going, um, or like Kelly said, she can monitor the chat and do the same thing. So uh, here we go. All right, so um, brain injury, let's just define it so that we're all on the same page as far as what a brain injury is. Uh, the right hand side of your screen has kind of the jargony term from Century Code. But basically, a brain injury is any damage to the brain after birth and prior to degenerative dementia. So um, like those at birth or those during in utero type injuries like fetal alcohol syndrome are kind of an exception. And then things like Alzheimer's is be an exception. But anything else that happens to the brain um, between birth and death um, is considered a brain injury. Um, and there are two types of brain injuries. So the umbrella term encompasses all of them, which is an ABI or acquired brain injury, but there are two types of acquired brain injuries. So there is traumatic brain injuries or TBIs, which majority of us are familiar with. Those are our falls, our assaults, our blast injuries, wow. domestic violence situations, motor vehicle crashes, those types of things. Um, but then there's a whole nother side <laughs> of the spectrum. Um, of non-traumatic injuries, so things like a stroke, tumors, anoxia. Anoxia is referring to oxygen deprivation, um, strangulations or chokes, um, near near hangings, near drownings, um, things like that are all related to our breathing, and it's very important that we stay breathing. Um, drug overdoses as well fall into that anoxia 
Um, so if, if someone's needed to be Narcan or um, naloxone, both of those would be examples of of brain injury, um, aneurysm, and then infections. So things like meningitis and encephalitis can cause a brain injury. Uh, long COVID has been showing similar um, symptomology related to brain injury as well. So um, we like to make sure that you're aware of this so that you understand the prevalence is much more than um, just TBIs. So when we do look though at just TBIs, um, about 2.8 million occur nationally a year. But if you look at that chart there, um, and we've seen that number of people die um, get smaller and smaller since about the 1980s. So more and more people are surviving injuries, um, but oftentimes they are just treated and released from an emergency department and not necessarily told you have a brain injury or this potentially is a brain injury and could lead to symptom um, symptoms later on in life. Um, I would say those that middle column of those that get hospitalized are the ones that um, that are on our radar and we usually know about them and they usually know that they have a brain injury. It's those treated and released that that are really concerning that huge number for those. Um, so those were nationwide numbers now here in North Dakota. Here's our North Dakota numbers. Um, so each year we have about 5500 um, TBIs that are sustained. Um, about, uh, so this is um, the second bullet point there is from 2015 reporting, um, basically saying that about 2.5% of North Dakotans um, have been told at one time they had a stroke. So if we take both of those numbers, um, basically 13,000 North Dakotans are currently living with a long-term disability from a brain injury. So. Uh, when we do go to the doctor's office, and maybe you have, maybe you've been in a car accident. I know Rebecca had one um, quite a while ago now, but um, she was really happy with the way um, it was here in Grand Forks yeah. and Ultra did ask her questions about loss of consciousness, and that's good. So that is mainly how the doctor's office gauges brain injury severity for a TBI. So basically, the longer you are unconscious, the more likely you are to have long-term deficits and long-term impairments. So a mild injury is someone that has loss of consciousness less than 30 minutes. A moderate injury would be a loss of consciousness between 30 minutes and 24 hours. And then a severe injury would be longer than 24 hours. Um, so a, a coma would be um, considered a severe brain injury. And I will interrupt that actually yeah. right now, the as we speak, they are reevaluating that mild, moderate to severe like criteria because it's not very accurate. No. <laughs> and they're supposed to by the end of the month, by the end of January, they're supposed to actually have um like an updated criteria. So awesome. we would have to like, you know, redo all of our presentations and everything, but definitely looking forward to that because so when um, you say they, Rebecca, like CDC Oh, they or... so yes, they as the large brain injury community. So okay. there are rep there's a committee that's come together with representation from Brain Injury Association of America, uh, Brain Injury Alliance, um, uh, the Centers for Disease Control. Um, so it's a large committee that has like you know, 40 different people on it representing all these different national organizations. Um, and so hopefully we will have uh, some updated criteria when we present in the future. Perfect. Thank you. I wasn't aware of that either. So that's exciting because, yes, this is very misleading. And that kind of leads us into this slide as well. Um, well, one thing, <laughs> whenever I screen someone for brain injury, we ask about loss of consciousness and a lot of people are like, well, I don't know, I was unconscious, right? So it's a very hard um, thing to use as a parameter um, because a lot of people don't necessarily know. But um, this uh, slide is kind of referring to the fact that, that, that brain injury is such a continuum or it has, a, it goes from mild, moderate, to severe. So when we think about earthquakes, and I would always say we don't have them around here, but then about like two months ago or so, there was one in South Dakota. I don't know if anybody saw that. It was a really minor one, but there was one in South Dakota that was more like your bottom picture, the cracks, but 
they did have one. Um, so basically, this is the same idea with brain injury, where a severe brain injury, you know, that's hemorrhages, penetrating wounds, significant devastation to that person, just like significant devastation to um, a city. But mild injuries also can be just as devastating for that person. Um, but we don't see at it as easily and it's harder to, to see the damage and see what's broken. But there is something clearly wrong. So there's a lot of new findings, too, that say that if we've had multiple mild injuries, they have a compounding effect to be more like a severe injury. So that is a lot of the population that we are seeing um, like and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But a lot of those people are those multiple mild where um, it maybe wasn't a significant injury that would have been documented at a hospital level, but um, but more of a smaller level. So these are the leading causes of TBI now for general population. So you're going to see leading causes for other populations here in a little bit. And I just want you to keep this one in mind that the number one reason is falls. And specifically here in North Dakota, um, slipping and falling on the ice is the number one reason for brain injury. So now with that snow on the ground and that ice on the ground, make sure you're salting your sidewalks and keeping your sidewalks clear, wearing those spikes on the bottoms of your shoes. They do now even sell shoes with the spikes already built into them, which are pretty cool. They're a little spendy, but they're pretty neat looking. Um, my aunt just ordered a pair. I'll have to give you her report someday about how they work. Um, but yeah, just being really careful about um, walking on the ice. But you can see um, the next highest prevalence is that struck by or against. So it's a little different than an assault or a domestic violence case. It's more like um, my best example is I had a basketball player that she was playing a game. Another player hit her and then she hit the wall. So it was the wall that caused the damage, right? So that's kind of an example of that struck by against. And then traffic incidences and assaults um, make up a lot of others. Um, we do have a lot of unknown and a lot of other because a lot of people don't necessarily go in or report or disclose what happened to them because they might be worried about um, you know, possible legal ramifications um, for a spouse or something if that, if like domestic violence was the case. So this slide always is um, an interesting one to look at, but it is true that there are um, areas that all across all three components, um, physical, cognitive, and emotional, behavioral that our clients struggle with. Um, and a lot of people will look at this and say like, oh, I struggle with some of this. I could have a brain injury. But the real thing is that it's chronic and that it's across all three areas, too. So it's not just like they have headaches sometimes, you know, it's that they have headaches and then they also have memory loss and then they have mood swings because of all of that. So it's really the three things um, tie in together. Uh, I would say the physical symptoms we hear the, the least amount of complaints about. Um, a lot of those tend to kind of resolve themselves or there are things that we can do um, to help with those and there are with all three, but the physical ones, um, we hear the least amount of complaints. It's more the cognitive and the behavioral emotional that we hear mostly about. The cognitive changes from the survivor themselves. A lot of them report, you know, I feel stupid now. I feel like a retard, but they're not. Um, your IQ does not change after a brain injury. Uh, and so that's really hard for people to understand because they feel like it has changed but it's really that we need to figure out the way that they learn now they probably learn differently than they did before their injury that's one unique thing about brain injury is that there's a significant before and after and usually the person knew themselves before and now they have to kind of find that new normal so that leads into that emotional and behavioral component which we also hear a lot of complaints or you know concerns from family members and friends of this person that knew them before and now are concerned because they look the same. So brain injury is very, very invisible. We can't see it. There's usually no outward signs. Um, sometimes people will have scars maybe in their hairlines and things like that. But generally speaking, I could line up, you know, 10 of my clients and 10 general population people and I would guarantee you wouldn't be able to tell the difference um, by just appearance. So um, that emotional behavioral piece can be really tricky and we do a lot of work behind that um, or around that on dealing with, you know, um, 
basically coping strategies, breathing strategies. Um, I always remind clients that their breath is free and it is always with them. And so use it to your advantage as a natural, it is a natural tranquilizer to the body. So, um, but there's kind of an all encompassing list there. So basically without proper supports, individuals with brain injury tend to be involved in a cycle of failure or they, um, come with um, a lot of times there's mental health and addiction issues and, and oftentimes there's involvement within the criminal justice system. Um, so structure needs to be offered um, and oftentimes when that structure isn't offered um, is when we start to see the brain injury really kind of unmask. So um, this is referring to a lot of our kids that have an injury at a young age, so zero to four is one of our significant age groups for TBI, but a lot of those injuries get forgotten about. You know, a kid might have a bad fall at three and, you know, maybe didn't lose consciousness either because that's another tricky thing about that severity continuum we showed you is that it doesn't always apply to children. So children are much like less likely to lose consciousness than an adult in like a significant accident. Um, they have more, they have, less body for their adrenaline to pump through so their adrenaline kicks in faster than an adult's adrenaline does so let's say my daughter and i who is six got into a car accident and i lose consciousness and she doesn't i'm probably going to be assessed pretty thoroughly but she might not be at the doctor's office and so a lot of that can get missed um but we really see those behaviors start to unmask when we hit kind of like that middle school puberty type age is when i get majority of my referrals um, and that's when that um, structure tends to kind of go a little bit away, kind of when we become more of an adult, we need to navigate our classroom environment more and maybe get ourselves up and ready for the day. Maybe mom and dad go to work and my day starts a little later, so now I have to be more responsible for that. And that's when we see the fall down start to happen. Um, but a lot of times it's those frontal lobe and temporal lobe injuries that are causing these problems because those lobes are responsible for our behavior regulation and our executive functioning skills. And our executive functioning skills are housed right in that frontal lobe. And they, in layman's terms, I always refer to them as our adulting skills. When I talk to clients, they're, they're adulting, they're paying their bills on time, getting to work, um, being socially appropriate. All of those things are what get our clients typically in trouble. They usually can do the job you're asking or the, the task you're asking as long as they have it presented in a correct way, um, in a good format, but it's often those more socially type behaviors that get them kind of in trouble. Um, so we've really been trying to promote screening across North Dakota and ideally we would love people to screen universally screen. So anyone that comes through their door, comes to their office or their or across their desk gets a brain injury screen because those screening programs have shown that brain injuries do hide in plain sight. They're very invisible and they hide a lot though within our high risk populations. So about 12% of the general population have a history of brain injury. But when we zoom in on special populations that you see here, the number goes up significantly. So the homeless is about 50% behavioral health. Um, so we're, with behavioral health, we're referring to like mostly mental health and substance abuse. So that's 60%, uh, criminal justice, 60%, and then intermittent partner violence is about 75%. Um, so if, as you're listening to clients talk, if they're talking about anything that, you know, sets off alarm bells in your head as far as one of these special populations that would be a great time to, to get out the brain injury screener that we have um, our screener takes five minutes to implement five to ten minutes it's four questions it's it's really a simple tool um, and you can either be trained from us how to implement it or you can reach out to us and we can implement together too but um, so when we're looking at just homeless um, a lot of people say, well, it's dangerous to be homeless, right? There's a lot of crime on the streets and things like that, and, and it makes sense that they would have a brain injury, but that's not the case. A lot of our individuals sustain their brain injury prior to becoming homeless. So they get their brain injury, and then those cognitive symptoms and those emotional behavioral things come into play and those adulting skills, and then that causes them 
to kind of be involved in this cycle of failure. Um, so our homeless populations, um, the numbers are extremely high. We go down to the downtown engagement center in Fargo once a week and we um, we do a lunch and learn um, program there. And um, I would say the numbers are like 90% that I've screened there have been positive for brain injury. So when we look at criminal justice involved about 50 to 80 percent, it depends on the study that you look at um, with offender populations. So I have some more slides that show that. So this shows you the rates of reported TBIs in prison studies, and this is across all areas. So this is across different states. This is other countries like the NZ is New Zealand. Um, New South Wales is in Australia, I believe. So and then Ohio, Texas, so you can see it's it hovers right around that 80 to 90 percent mark across um, universally. So um, this isn't just a United States type problem. Um, here's kind of those reported LOCs. And if you remember from the severity continuum, LOC stands for loss of consciousness. So these are um, the rates of those that reported a loss of consciousness. So again, kind of just uh, reiterating that whole traumatic brain injury piece. Uh, Minnesota, Minnesota, our neighbors right next door did a very interesting study with 998 inmates and look at how high their numbers came out. In particular, I think it's important to look at those juvenile males, 98%. So that is significant. Um, there are some states that are um, starting to screen domestic violence cases that come in for brain injury. They will screen the, you know, typically it's a female that that was the victim and they will screen the female and then they will screen any kids in the home and i think that's a great idea and hopefully we can move to something like that in north dakota someday and hopefully try to catch some of these juveniles and give them the right skills before they end up involved in the system um but now here's that change that i talked about earlier so if you remember before the change for general population what was it what was the cause Uh, do you anyone who remember? Winter. Winter, yes, Kelvin, yes. In North Dakota, it was falls. Yep, in particular, the winter. So now it has changed to assault. Um, or I had someone interestingly enough say it's probably it's more like it's self defense. But either way, we look at it, fights and things are the cause. So that falls goes significantly down from the general population. Um, occurrence there. Uh, Colorado is the state that has a lot of money to play with when it comes to brain injury. If you get a um, driving under the influence um, citation in Colorado, the money that you pay for that um, DUI goes into a TBI fund. So they have a lot of money and they have been able to do a lot of really neat studies in Colorado. Um, and here you can see kind of the screening numbers. Um, so just because someone screens positive doesn't necessarily mean they have a brain injury. But if you look at this, of those screened, 73% did have a formal brain injury diagnosis. So to get that formal diagnosis, if it's not an already medically documented diagnosis, we need to send them to a neuropsychologist. And so even looking at these numbers, they still, a, a significant number of those that screen positive did qualify as having a formal diagnosis of brain injury. Uh, this just is is um, kind of going over the prevalence among those high populations and how they they kind of work together. They they overlap and there's a lot of interesting um, prevalence if individuals have experienced childhood violence or been an adult victim or had suicide attempts. They also have high brain injury numbers. Um, so this is just looking at all those co-occurring um, along with a brain injury. So women and especially women involved in the criminal justice system, um, especially if they were convicted of a violent crime, they usually sustained a pre-crime traumatic brain injury or, or some other form of physical abuse. So that traumatic brain injury that they had, um, again, that emotional dysregulation piece that leads to their symptomology to be more likely to be involved in a violent crime. So um, 
Screening across intimate partner violence, um, we could do a lot better in North Dakota, I think. If you work with one of those agencies and you'd like to start screening within them, we'd love to have a conversation about that. Um, the hesitancy we've heard so far was that they didn't want to kind of re reopen wounds and, and bring up things from the past with individuals that have experienced domestic violence or intimate partner violence. But we would argue or I would argue that um, knowing you have a brain injury is much more powerful than, you know, having to, to re talk about the trauma that you experienced because it will help lead you to much more appropriate services and interventions. Um, so I also, you know, we use a, a very short, it's a modified Ohio State University screener that really doesn't get into a lot of details. People don't need to tell me, you know, specifics about their injury they can just tell me roughly what happened and they don't have to get into details so we don't need to worry so much about reopening those wounds it can be a very simple yes no type answer to the screening questions that we ask uh juvenile justice as you can imagine also fits into these special populations um, and again, their causes were mostly from assaults, but 67% of screen detainees had at least one brain injury, and that's adolescents in New York City jails. Um, very similar numbers, a little bit lower reported in Pennsylvania, um, but a lot still showing evidence of impairment. So majority of injuries across studies they sustained their injury prior to their first criminal activity. So when we screen someone for brain injury, the first question we ask, we have, we read a prompt that talks, tries to get their memory to think about any incidences they might've had in their entire life affecting their head or their neck. And one of them we ask though is how old were you if you did have a loss of consciousness? So there's a lot of um, studies out there that show that if your injury happened before the age of 15, you are more likely to be involved in a cycle of failure because a 15 year old is um, acquiring skills to be an adult. Their brain isn't done yet. Our brain isn't finished developing until we're like 26, 27 years old. And so a 15 year old um, and anything before that um, hasn't had a chance to, they're, they're not maintaining skills like an adult is, they're still acquiring their skills. And so that acquiring is going to be a lot messier than someone that's um, already maintained those skills from before. So even if it's an early, even if it's a mild early childhood brain injury, it still can lead to behavioral problems or involvement with law enforcement later on in life. Um, there are three more times likely as young adults to have alcohol or drug dependencies. Um, I think this has a lot to do with impulsivity. Impulsivity is a major hallmark of brain injury. We kind of have three eyes we refer to um, impatience, impulsivity, and irritability. But that impulsivity piece, I think, is um, huge and speaks to this a lot because it's um, those impulsive individuals are a lot less likely to say no to substances, right? They're going to go with the group and, and do what people say and um, not necessarily say no. So having those conversations with parents is important and with the child themselves. Um, the doctor that did this study um, about adults and their substance use um, overlap with brain injury talked about if we don't warn people about the possibility of abusing substances after a brain injury is like not warning Little Red Riding Hood about the big bad wolf. So we need to warn people that there is um, a likelihood that they might start to use after brain injury. So as far as the impact that these individuals have on our corrections system is um, they're more likely to have been using substances prior to incarceration. They have more prior incarceration, so their recidivism rates are very, very high. It's kind of a revolving door. Um, they use a lot of services while they're incarcerated, and they're less likely to follow the rules while incarcerated. So they're your expensive inmates, and they also um, can be your troublemakers too, basically. So um, they also have lower treatment completion rates and higher rates of disciplinary incidences. And then, like I said, higher rates of recidivism. Um, and a lot of this is related to their symptomology, which we're gonna talk about. So symptomology of brain injury, 
Um, it's very complicated and it looks very different from person to person. Oftentimes we say if you've met one brain injury survivor, you've met one brain injury survivor. Um, but every so everyone's response can be a little bit different and we're going to get into that here in a minute. But also those undiagnosed or those that aren't getting the right treatment. Um, sometimes we have people that will go to certain providers that maybe their their doctor mentioned, you know, um, go to PT for vestibular therapy and they'll go to session after session after session, but they're not seeing results. And that's probably because that doesn't make sense for the type of brain injury that they have. So if we determine the right kind of brain injury, then we can get them the right treatment. But when we look at the brain itself, um, individuals that brain injury can affect activities of self-management and our ability to interact with other people. So um, emotional dysregulation, impulsivity, and impaired processing speed are likely to be the most that linked to the criminal justice system. So that impaired processing speed also, I think, speaks to this slide here about uh, the lower completion rates of treatment. Um, those, those groups, those, um, those um, treatment groups tend to move at a pretty fast pace and there's a lot of conversation happening in the room. And someone with brain injuries, the processing is significantly delayed typically. And so they need longer think time and wait time and just longer think um, and processing time. And so if they don't have that time to process what's going on, they're more likely to not be successful in that in that completion of that treatment group. So we typically recommend with our clients that are utilizing treatment groups, whether it even be like NA or AA, or um, uh, there's a great manual called the SUBI manual, substance use and brain injury that's available on our website um, that you can look at too, but that kind of is a slowed down version of a lot of those. But we always recommend that they talk to the leader of that group and ask for almost kind of like a pre-group one-on-one um, -on -one time, then you do the group together, and then you do like a post group. So they're kind of getting like um, double what everybody else is getting or triple, I suppose it would be what everybody else is getting um, so that they can can have that longer time to process things. But um, okay, so the skull. So when we're in person, we bring a skull with us and we show you this skull and we pass it around and have you touch it. But basically, our brain is very soft and mushy. Um, I have heard that it is, um, I've heard mayonnaise, I have heard jello, I have heard um, flan. Flan is probably the one that they say is the best um, representation of the consistency of the brain. My certified brain injury specialist trainer said that when you take the brain out of the skull and you put it on a table in an autopsy, it splats. And then it doesn't really need like a sharp knife to cut it. You can cut it with a butter knife. So it's very, very soft. And then it is sitting inside of this really lumpy and bumpy skull. And we have these bony ridges inside of our skull that um, oftentimes result to injury to those temporal and frontal lobes, especially during rapid acceleration. So in those like car accident type situations where you know the brakes were slammed down when you're driving 80 miles an hour your head probably bounced around inside your skull um, causing damage to to those areas which those areas then lead to a lot of where our adult thinking skills reside um, so um, the frontal lobe also is impacted by this as well so like I said, if you could feel it in person, um, you can kind of see there, it's it's very sharp and ridgy on the inside. And then this bottom hole down here is where all of our like breathing and well, that's where our spine connects, but it's also um, like where the reptilian brain is housed. So that's where our breathing and our staying alive are housed. But the, so those are very important and they're protected. But then those other important skills, such as our adulting skills, are kind of more out there and susceptible to injury. So even when I talk with little kids about helmet safety, I always make sure you want to pull your helmet down, protect that frontal lobe, because um, a lot of kids will be riding their bikes around with their their helmet way up here on the top. But that's leaving that 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 forehead, that frontal lobe, open to injury. So that frontal lobe. Um, 
is basically responsible for our higher cognitive skills, or we call them our executive functioning skills. So these um, encompass a lot of things, our problem solving, our ability to be spontaneous, to remember things, to understand language, to get motivated, um, to use our judgment, our impulse control, and then that's also our social and our se sexual behavior. And when you also think about, you know, I just gave you the example of a bike rider, but car accidents, you think about domestic violence cases, a lot of injuries happen right there to that frontal lobe and look how many things that frontal lobe is responsible for. The temporal lobe is kind of right underneath um, and that's um, what controls like our smelling and our tasting and our senses and that kind of thing, but it's also where our aggressiveness and our sexual behavior and then it's also where language is. So there's kind of a lot of things going on there to unpack. So, um, you know, if we're aggressive and we have a lot of sexual frustration built up, but we can't express it, we can't use our words to find that, that can create a lot of these problems. This is um, a huge reason why we make a lot of referrals to speech language pathology. Um, so a speech language pathologist can really, really help in this area and give you really good tools um, on language comprehension and, and kind of getting that aggressiveness under control um, and just the language comprehension and processing piece. So we kind of call, so those are two um, main lobes in the brain. There are other lobes, there's two other lobes, but we really only focus on those two for most of our training purposes because they're so critically involved in managing our behavior and our emotions. So um, damage to those areas, those lobes, is, we kind of call that the fingerprint of traumatic brain injury. So again, undiagnosed injuries are really our plea and really a lot of your clients that you probably are working with um, might have an, a brain injury that they might not even be aware of. Um, if they were someone that dropped out of school, if they abuse substances, if they have a lot of failed relationships, if they're in the mental health system, if they are homeless um, or unable to find or maintain employment, those are all kind of those red flags that should indicate, OK, I should screen this person for brain injury or see if if the brain injury network can help me um, see if this is possibly a brain injury. Um, so a lot of times what happens is that symptoms uh, systems often don't document the brain injury. So um that's why we want brain injury screenings to be in place and and have a need um it's they're just they're hiding in plain sight many many times um, or people don't always connect the dots back to an injury that happened many many years ago um yesterday at the downtown engagement center we met a gentleman that um had a significant injury at the age of 18 he was jumped by a gang and loss of consciousness for longer than 24 hours, which is really significant. And now he ended up homeless many years later. Um, and so a lot of that could get tied back into he probably wasn't given like the proper skills um, to adult after that injury had happened. Um, so, yeah, we really, really, if you hear one thing from me today, I hope it's that you consider screening your clients for brain injury. Um, but we really don't want to treat brain injury as separate. So we can't just say, OK, this person has a brain injury. Let's let the brain injury network deal with them. No, um, number one, we don't have the staff capacity to deal with that. That, that would be a uh, perfect circle, but also the prevalence. And they're in so many populations that it just wouldn't make sense. So we really want you guys that aren't necessarily considered brain injury professionals to to be comfortable having these conversations about brain injury and just even understanding those things about the frontal and the temporal lobe and that um, the symptomology of brain injury can really, really impact people much more than they often realize. So we want to empower people by um, giving them the appropriate supports and advocacy efforts um, here, here. with their families just because it just helps them connect those dots a lot better and just really get the proper support. Um, so our role, basically, as I said before, we are contracted by HHS to serve as a central source of brain injury information, support and training in the state because it was identified that there was a lack of awareness, a lack of training and a lack of coordination across existing services. So that is the main part of, of our role. We don't 
provide direct services to any of our clients, but we help set them up with the people that will and what makes the most sense for them. We have a, a great symptom inventory that we use, so if someone screens positive, or if they come to us knowing they have brain injury, we do a symptom inventory with them that have the nine different um, cognitive symptoms that are related to brain injury. And uh, that can help us kind of decide where to start with individuals. Um, but some other things that we are doing, um, we presented to residents at JRCC, which is James River um, Correctional Center. Um, and that was one of our favorite presentations. And we, Rebecca and I got some really great questions, things that a lot of professionals have never asked us before, very insightful questions about brain injuries. And they, the, the inmates there really, they want to know if they have a brain injury and how they can help themselves um, manage symptoms if that is something they're struggling with. Um, we've worked a lot with people in Colorado. Um, like I said, Colorado is kind of like the gurus, if you will, in this area. And they've done a really lot of nice work. So we've kind of learned from them what to do, what not to do. Um, actually, on Friday this week, we have a meeting with our Department of Corrections, a lot of their key players, and um, Dr. Kim Gorgans, who is a neuropsychologist out of Denver State or, oh yeah, Denver, um, I forget which university, but I think it's DU, um, Denver University, and um, she's just amazing, and she's the one that developed that symptom inventory, but she's going to give us kind of some tips and tricks as we hopefully, um, the DOCR is looking at piloting um, screening for brain injury at the state penitentiary, so, uh, but if we do that, we want to make sure that we do it right, and that we roll it out the correct way, and that we're not over inundating ourselves and kind of opening a huge can of worms by doing that. So we're going to kind of get some tips and tricks from her. Um, we have our online screening and symptom inventory available. We do CIT trainings. Um, I am a standing presenter for Bismarck CIT. So CIT is a um, crisis intervention training for officers. Um, it's a really rigorous, it's a 40 hour training. They're there Monday through Friday for 40 hours that whole week and I'm two of those hours. And so I really try to plug the importance of, um, you know, especially the that processing piece and um, how, just best practices with working with. I, I present to the police officers that they should approach everyone in the field as if they were to have had a brain injury because we don't know, right? Um, I attended the Citizens Academy here in Grand Forks, and that's what that picture is. That's me on graduation. Uh, I don't know if other communities have Citizens Academies, um, but if you're in the Grand Forks area and you would want to go, I would highly, highly recommend it. It's a it's a time investment. It's a three hours a night um, for several nights, but the the information they cover is phenomenal. They basically give you an inside look at all the ins and outs of the police department in your community. I believe Bismarck has one too, um, but if it's not something your community has, it might be something to mention about starting because it was really, really informative. It was all free and there was about 20 or 30 of us that took it um, and just wanting to know more about what goes on. We exhibit a lot at jails and prison fairs. Um, so Nikki and Shannon, our resource facilitators, will be at um, the prison in Bismarck on Thursday exhibiting. And then we do things like this. So we just try to spread the word on these special populations. Um, I suppose missing from this slide, it will also be our involvement at the deck um, with Shannon coming on. So Shannon recently came on with the Brain Injury Network and she's located in Fargo. So then that will hopefully free up some of my day where I can now focus more time on Grand Forks. So I have been doing some screenings here at our mission in Grand Forks and then in hopes of um, gathering enough people to hopefully create a lunch and learn here in Grand Forks. Um, we are bringing someone on for the Bismarck area, so we'd like to see that happening out in Bismarck. Um, yeah. And there is our contact information. I'm ended a little bit short, but I hope we have some good questions and we can still have some discussion. Our website is really great, so I do always like to share some different things along our website. But do we have any questions to start? There was a lot of conversation going on in the chat because Calvin um, is a, a survivor of brain injury, so he has a lot of lived experience, which sure is. Does. Yeah, which is very, it's very interesting yes. um, to know. 
Um, there was a, a general or a per gentleman named Damon Damon. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrong. Um, just kind of ask like if a person doesn't know if they have a brain injury or um, a seizure, but you kind of mentioned about like your screening assessments that you were going to give. Yes, for them. I okay. can, yes, I can show you what that looks like. Yeah, that would so, be good. So, um, so really, what we do is see here. Oops. And I, I will also say that oh, next that. next week, that's really what we're going to cover is really in in depth walk through the screening process mm -hmm. and how um individuals can utilize that. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. So since so, we're on that right now, that'll be the same. It'll be Tuesday from noon to one. So it'll be the second session. So that would be also important to attend yes. if you're able to. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. So I can just show you quickly here what. Um, so as far as services um, go, we have a wide variety of things available on our website, but you can see right here there's brain injury screenings or you can find them under services and drop down to screening. Either way you can get there. But this kind of talks about why screening is important and who to use it with um, and kind of gives you this services roadmap, um, which is also available here um, and kind of explains the importance of screening and things you might know about people that mm -hmm. struggle. But here's kind of the roadmap. Basically, you can make a referral to us um, or give us a phone call. Um, and then we can implement the screening or um, I don't know that we're going to give you the username and the password to the portal next week. Are we Rebecca or what's your plan? Are we? What we would want. What are you thinking about that? I think we would want more of an idea before we do that of yeah. if they really are going to be doing the screening. Yes, exactly. So we we are happy to train your agency on screening as an agency and we can do that. There's so we have a portal within our website that allows you to log in and see the screener and I can just show you what it looks like right now, but we would want your agency trained and, and to have a conversation with us before we gave you that username and password, but mm -hmm. we will go over all of that. Um, next week, but I will just show you just so you can see what it looks like. Um, this is what the screening and like I said, this is from Ohio State University. Dr. John Corgan, there is a long version of this OSU, but we selected the modified the short version. Particularly because of its ease of implementation in the Latin, it doesn't take much time to implement at all. Um, so the first question is looking at TBI, the loss of consciousness. Um, and again, we're asking how old you were. Um, number two is looking at multiple mild impact, multiple repeated injuries. So I would say like those domestic violence type cases or mm -hmm. uh, BMX racers and rodeo riders and football players, all those that maybe weren't completely knocked out but had their bell rung many times. Um, number three would be looking at those drug overdoses and those chokes and strangulations. So more of those anoxic type injuries. And then the last one is looking at doctor type injuries. So um, a, has a doctor ever told you that you have seizures, that you have epilepsy or that you've had a stroke? Um, you know, we all like to go on WebMD and be, be doctors, <laughs> right? So we want to make sure that a doctor has told them that, that they have, because um, I will get a lot of people that will say like, oh, I have seizures. And it's like, okay, but has anybody ever really thoroughly, like have you had an EKG and has that been looked at um, significantly? So, so that is what the screener looks like. So we would train you on that um, as an agency, but this is ideally what we would like to see you um, pulling out when you get a client that has those like red flags that we just talked about um, or reaching out to us. So as far as referrals to us, those can be made right here in this. Um, so if you're on our homepage of our website, we have this client referral in the top right corner and then this referral form. So you can either type and fill out this form. It's got a, it's a fillable PDF, so you can do that 
or you can call our 855 number, which is pretty much listed all over the place on our website right down here, 855-866-1884. And Nikki Lib Dolan answers that. So she would um, help get set up if it's a screening you wanna try or implement. Um, we can always do it all together too. Um, a lot of what we've been trying to do is, you know, work closely with like those care coordinators at Community Connect or Free Through Recovery and train them kind of cross train them on brain injury so for example um we have all these tip sheets and so if you go under life after brain injury under brain injury information anyone that takes our symptom inventory is then given a score sheet that basically tells you like i have <laughs> concerns with your memory by the way you scored on your symptom inventory let's talk about your memory and some some skills that you are struggling with or some accommodations that we could make to your day to make your memory better um so a lot of times um like friday i went over to center and i went to spectra health both places and they both um both care coordinators have clients with brain injury that i help write their goals and just help kind of give them ideas on what they could do as far as the brain injury is concerned to help with different strategies so one example um if you have a consistent time that you meet with someone let's say you um sorry i got distracted by the chat box let's say uh, you have a client that um ah, i'm sorry i got really distracted there um but yeah i brought these basically to spectra and to the clients there we have tip sheets to go as well but each tip sheet has one for survivors and one professor for professionals and here i think they look nicer when the printable versions but this is what the printable version looks like um and so it gives a definition of what memory is it gives you what to look for if they're struggling with memory but then really to me the important part is the accommodations on the back so kind of as a care coordinator, maybe like working through clients with how to set these up. Um, you know, if they want to keep a journal, helping them even get a journal to write in, um, getting a label maker, labeling things around their house, if that's something that would be beneficial for them. Just kind of those tips and tricks. And so, some of the feedback that we've gotten from care coordinators and peer, peer support specialists is when clients do like identify the brain injury but then complete like our symptom inventory then it does give them like these tip sheets and lets them know kind of the symptoms that they're struggling with it then gives kind of a starting point for that care coordinator peer support specialist and working with them moving forward mm -hmm. so like at the next meeting being able to use that as kind of a touch point to say Okay, you know, you had we talked about your memory and that you're struggling with your memory. Last time we met, you selected that you were going to work on implementing, you know, this accommodation strategy. How is that going? What help do you need with that? So we have gotten that feedback that it kind of for particularly sometimes with these individuals with brain injury, it can be really, really hard setting goals with them. Um, this is something we'll talk about, like, but setting goals because that's that's an area that they struggle in you know goal setting is an executive function skill that's a much yeah. high level skill and so for a lot of the times these individuals they they have a, they struggle with setting goals they struggle with prioritizing all of that but completing the symptom inventory and then having this tip sheet kind of can help guide the setting of those goals and guide future like meetings with them and direction yeah and so what i was about to say was consistency is what i that was my brain part was that if you have someone you meet with regularly if you can meet with them like always on fridays at one or whatever time of day works for you that can go a long way and i know that the the gal i work with at spectra and her client do that and that has helped him be able to get to all of her meetings consistently um, so it reflects positively on him as well when we have that consistency. But that we learned from a probation officer, Jill Crone, that we used to work with quite a bit. And she found that very quickly on that if you have a consistent date and time when working with a client um, and if 
something needs to happen on Friday at one when you normally meet, then just canceling and rescheduling for the next Friday at one, but not trying to have the meeting now Tuesday at nine, because that client is not going to come Tuesday at nine. They're probably going to come like Friday at nine because you told them a different day, but they didn't remember the time. And then the next week, it's just going to get you off for a couple weeks, not even just one week. It's going to be several weeks of getting them back on track. Um, I've learned that from my moved my support group a couple times and it was months before we were back on track, but mm -hmm. it just, um, yeah, just even those simple tips like that. Uh, help. That's awesome. Any more questions? Answer anything. Okay. Um, I'm going to put in the chat right now, like I had said, um, the link for you guys to complete um, a survey which is anonymous and then after that it will allow for you guys to fill out information um, to get like a certificate of attendance and or CEUs um, as well um, and that's valid for up to seven days so which will lead us up until next Tuesday to the next session number two um, if you guys don't have any other questions do you, does anyone else have any final thoughts? Or are we good to go? Some positive Where, where would we find that link at? I put it in the, where? the chat, but I'm also going to email it to you guys as well. Okay. And yeah, Kelvin, I found I that yes, I was referring to you, but I didn't want to call you out in front of the group. But Kelvin, what was it? How many sessions of PT did you go to before they're like, this isn't going to help? something crazy something 30 some sessions i think it's right good, but, but yeah i was just going through the chat again um, um oh one other final thing too for those that do work with the community connect program on our application which you guys um you know you can see we do ask the question about if a person has possibly had like a brain injury and if they've answered that that would be a a sign for you to um, do do a screening with them and then yes. kind of refer them for brain injury services. You want to make sure that we're doing that as a yeah. reminder. Yes, yes. And we're hoping that you guys will add even more questions because the studies show that that doesn't work to just ask it once like that. But yeah. we'll see. We're hoping yeah. to get we're 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 trying to get Heather on board there to add our whole screener <laughs> in, but uh, we'll see. But uh, yeah, the, but basically people don't talk like that. They don't say I've had a brain injury. So you're no. probably not going to hear that. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to yeah. hear, I hit my head, I rung my bell, I yeah. I got knocked out. You know, it's just yeah. not common that, and, and the doctor doesn't always speak that way either. Because right. even a concussion is a brain injury. So people will be told they have a concussion. And so they won't necessarily correlate that with brain injury. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, I believe we ask, um, I'm not 100% because I don't have our app pulled up, but we ask if someone has um, had an injury from like a fall or a fight or, you know, something along okay. those lines. Okay, well, a little more specific. So we good. do good. ask that, good. yeah, but I'm not 100%. But yeah, a lot of people do walk around with a brain injury and they don't They don't know it, yeah, yeah, they're not aware. Yeah. yeah. They're saying this session isn't, isn't on the link. There's the session is not on the link. What what do you mean by that, Robin? Oh, when you go to the evaluation what? section, se when oh. you go to that link, Kelly, oh. it doesn't list this presentation as one of the options. Oh, it doesn't. I thought I had that in there. OK, and then Gina, you had a question. I don't know if it was related to that or something else. Yes, it was related to that. Um, but I also wanted to say thank you for the presentation. It's very informative. You're welcome. Thank you for attending. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Callie. I see you commented. Yes, I work with Callie over at Spectra. Hi, mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear you find it's helpful. Yeah, it definitely is. Good presentation. Thank you. Hey, thanks, guys. We will see you all next week, hopefully, and then yes. we can dive even deeper into all of this. Do you have suggestions on what we should click then since this training isn't an option? Hold on. Here I'm going to. Oh, oh yeah, yes. I don't think any of the brain injury ones are on here, are they? 
I I would just say for attendees that Heather and Kelly are going to work on yeah. getting that updated, and then Kelly will send yeah. out the link. And so just do it via the link that Kelly emails out once right. it's fixed. Right. And I will also send Kelly those slides right now to Kelly if you want to include yeah. the slides from today. I know someone had asked earlier if they were going to be available. So I already did that, Carly. Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> On it. Yes, we'll get it fixed. Apologies. Well, if without the everyone is free to go, then thank you guys so much for attending. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. I'll stay on just for like a couple minutes in case anyone has anything. You're welcome. <laughs>